All right, welcome again to the Endo Sync. Uh, this is our conversation with our friends at MetaMask and Agoric uh, and uh, the, uh, the community at Broad if they're interested in coming. <laughs> so we, we publish these. Um, the, uh, today I'm gonna do a recap of the demo I did last week and then talk about the new features for the pet demon. Um, so Endo, uh, is many things, but one of the things that we can think of it is as a uh, think Docker, but JavaScript, but actually confined. Um, that is to say, uh, uh, and, and another framing that I'm growing fond of is we can call it a uh, the foundation of a web of bots. <laughs> uh, mostly because that means that we get to spell web of bots, W-O-B, which naturally leads into the is it wob scale? Um, and yes, of course it's wob scale. This is for, the intention is to have like a fully decentralized execution model for for essentially bots. Um, I have to admit I'm missing yet another cultural reference. What is wob scale? <laughs> uh, somebody please send Mark the uh, the the uh, the MongoDB takedown. <laughs> If I, I believe that's the origin of the term mob scale. <laughs> um, the, uh, it, uh, yeah, uh, that might be it. It's, it's the silly, the, the silly, uh, synthesized voice cartoon. Yeah. <laughs> yes. The one. All right, cool. So web of bots <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and and the reason why I'm it's arriving at this idea of web of bots is the idea is that the confined applications are going to communicate to the to their to the local supervisor, the user agent, um, through an API that resembles what you might end up being the API for a bot. Um, it can request things from the user. It can uh, pose questions to the user. It can say things to the user. That that's that's largely what the API is from the inside of an application um, that that's running inside of an endo executor. Um, and those applications, the 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 motivating use case currently still is. Uh, uh, there are a, a small number of initial motivating use cases. One of which is uh, uh, the a bridge to to allow MetaMask snaps to run outside of the browser in a hardened JavaScript execution model. This would also be a vessel for running stuff under Lava Moat in this execution model. It's also a way that we would be able to create a link to the Agoric chain using uh, what, what, what you might call an unsafe service, which I'll show uh, today. Uh, and unsafe services would be able to introduce new capabilities uh, and and uh, attenuate them so that they're safe to share with confined applications. Um, so let me let me start over the demo um, and get everybody back up to speed. I'm going to share my terminal. Um, let's let's start over from nothing. I have four windows. I'm going to use all of them. Um, over here, I'm going to say uh, on my computer user uh, in my home directory is where all of the state is going to go that gets persisted between runs of the endo executor. And this state is going to allow the restoration of particular object graphs upon the restart of the application. Um, so I'm going to watch find endo, which currently does not exist. Good. I think we're in the right place. Um, <laughs> Uh, because the first thing I'm going to do over here is reset endo, which deletes this directory with all of the state. Uh, it also deletes the caches and any ephemeral state which occur in different directory in direct in different directories. You can use the endo where command to find out where all of these state directories are, and they uh, correspond largely to what you would use with the cross uh, cross platform desktop groups recommendations. Um, and can be overridden with environment variables. So endo where state is going to tell you that. Endo where log is going to show you where the log file is. Endo where cache, where caches would get dropped. Endo where sock, which is where the Unix domain socket or named pipe is for purposes of, of uh, communicating with the current, you know, with the, the current user if I, or profiles um, uh, daemon. And the daemon currently is listening on what I'm calling version zero of our proto of a CAPTP protocol. 
Um, so I've included that in the name of the socket so a future version of endo can listen with multiple protocols. Um, this gives us uh, this gives us a point where we can extend endo to um, have versioned communication. Um, yeah, and notably, these are very different depending on what operating system you are on. So that's all part of the part of this endoware package, which allows multiple multiple applications to converge on where all of these things are. Um, that's important because there's the browser needs to be able to find it, for example, and the endo CLI needs to be able to find the daemon. And uh, yeah, okay, so. Uh, I've reset endo. What can I do with endo? I can first and first off, I can store a file. Um, and that puts it into a content address store. I'm going to store endo's readme, and I'm going to assign that a pet name of endo readme. The effect of this should be endo where state cd. Go there and then, oh, I see. I put the watch in the wrong directory. Uh, find, uh, watch, find endo. Whoop. And this time spelled as if I didn't have a funny keyboard. Okay. So now the, the, what the, so the result of running endo store, um, read me, let me, uh, it looks so much more convincing if I start over. I'm going to set reset, which nukes that directory. Um, and restarts endo, so it has a log and a cap TP. I'm going to actually over here follow the endo daemon log, which tells us that it's listening on the socket and what its PID is and has received one connection already. Um, I'm going to store endo readme as endo readme, and the effect of that is that the endo daemon has received a connection, it received it, and stored a file in this content address store which means that in the future I can say endo show and I can show anything that has a pet name I'm going to endo show the endo readme oh uh, doesn't exist maybe oh right I used the wrong command endo store endo readme with the name endo readme and it should have been an error um that the command line didn't took an argument that shouldn't have been there um stay tuned for fix Okay, so now I'm assigning a pet name. This is actually kind of an opportunity because you'll notice that the previous command did not create a pet name um, for the thing that would, was stored, and now I have, which and which is significant because um, pet names can be overwritten much in the way that git refs can be overwritten, whereas the content address store is immutable. Um, so endo show endo readme is going to yeah, seriously. Okay, so that doesn't work right now. <laughs> Let's see if this still works. No? Maybe I... Ah, work in progress. This, this should corrupt pet name into readme. Uh, doesn't exist? Okay, so this is what it looks like to debug endo. <clears throat> uh, okay, uh, I had an error pass over here. I don't have a useful stack trace. No reference exists for pet name endo readme, Jason. Okay, well, let's see if anything else works. Well, suffice it to say that should have written out the readme. Um, the, some, something else I can do is spawn a worker. I'm going to name that worker worker that's going to create a worker by with a uuid over here and uh capture its log and then that allows me to do uh an eval command inside of a worker so i'm going to evaluate the number 42 and save it with the name 42. okay that has created a pet name for 42 and a value uuid which is the thing that which describes how that would have been reconstructed. Let's take a look deeper at that. If I look in the endo state, uh, one thing you're going to see is that there's uh, going back, there's a, the SHA-512. Well, here's the readme for endo stored inside of the state. So I can recover. 
So in a future restart, if I were to restart Endo, Endo restart, um, and Endo, well, it didn't work the first time, so why would it this time? Uh, let's show 42. The idea here is that Endo is going to reconstruct all of the inter intermediate nodes that are necessary in order to produce the value 42. And the number 42 can be an arbitrary EREF, that is to say, a capability um, that extends outside of the system. And you'll see that again soon. But yeah, and so suffice it to say, you should, uh, the pet name Endo Readme should correspond to a readable file with this content. And having that content in the content address store preserves it across reruns. Um, the pet name for Endo Readme is just saying, hey, here's my SHA 512. So you can find it in the conventional location. 42 is saying, I'm a value. Here's my value UUID. So look in that castle to find out how to get it. Um, and worker is saying, hey, I'm this is a, I'm a worker with this UUID. Um, so if I go over to value UUID, this is how to reconstruct the number 42. You go over to the worker with this UUID and eval that source. And I have endowed, I have not endowed this particular compartment with um, any further capabilities. So this is an exhaustive list of all of the references needed in order to produce the value 42. Whereas if I were to say endo eval in worker, uh, 84, <laughs> I can say 42 times two, and then I'm going to take an endowment 42, and I'm going to save this to 84. This produces a new value node over here, which has the source 42 and says that, hey, in order to create 42, I need the value. Um, let me re rewrite this uh, in, yeah. So in this worker, I'm going to evaluate the string 42 times two, which needs to be, and then the compartment in which I evaluate it in that worker needs to be endowed with a reference to 42, whatever that happens to be. As a value, that's pretty trivial. Um, so uh, other things I can do. Let me show you service.js. This is new. Um, service.js is an unconfined application that uses as its calling convention that it exports a main zero that will be given a power box. Um, you could call it an admin an API that you can reach out to request other capabilities. The user will be given an opportunity to intervene. Um, so each time a, a worker asks for a power, the user will be asked yes or no. Not, not yes or no. It's like, do you wish? Uh, not a yes or no question. They'll say the, the worker wants the meaning of life, the universe, and everything. And it's going to store the result such that it persists to the next restart using a name a pet name local to itself, local to the worker, for the purposes of restoring it after you restart the system as a whole. Um, if you omit this argument, the re the user will still be requested, but uh, but the the uh, it will not persist to the next run. So every time uh, it will not be memoized and will not have a pet name. Um, so each time an ephemeral request gets issued, the the response is scoped to the lifetime of the current worker. Um, and you can request the same thing multiple times if you wish. So my expectation is um, that you will use requests to establish communication channels that are restorable to all of the things that you need. And an endo restart will uh, uh, allow the user to continue without being re needlessly reinterrogated for all of the things that had previously given capabilities. Um, so. How does this work? So endo import unsafe zero service uh, in worker by with the name worker, this service is, uh, and then let's restore our watch up here so that you can see it live. What you're going to see here is that uh, there will be a new value UUID and pet name. I'm going to save this as service. So from that, I get an alleged service. Uh, the So service is going to be a new pet name, uh, endo show service. 
should work endo restart endo show service should get us back to that position so like imagine you've rebooted your computer service is persistent and then I can do endo eval in worker e service I want the answer to life the universe and everything which is part of the API provided by service right so I'm calling this method in this evaluation I'm calling this method of my service in the same worker as the service um, and it in turn is going to interrogate the user for the answer and and provide it back okay uh so I'm going to call that mm, oh right service isn't defined maybe I need to endow uh endow my evaluation one moment while I struggle with zoom um so I need to pass service uh, I need to endow the the evaluation with the service okay now you will note that it's hanging the reason why is because it has reached out the service has now reached out to the user and does not and has is holding a promise for whether the user is willing to grant uh, uh, or, and willing to grant the request so endo inbox is going to give me a list of all of the requests from various workers undefined is supposed to be the worker UUID or the pet name corresponding to the worker with that UUID I haven't written the lookup the the lookup logic yet so it's not complete um, but what I can do now is say hey I'm going to resolve request zero with 42 and you'll note that uh my request was uh fulfilled over here and I can do that and I can also say restart endo and endo show answer is going to re-walk the re uh, reinitialize the worker reevaluate uh, re 42 reevaluate the request uh, that was that was sent to the service uh and and get the answer and you'll note that this time I what the user was not interrogated for the answer to the life the user the life the inner the life universe and everything and the reason for that is because the worker itself captured a pet name for answer um so it had a path to restore the capability that was granted on the previous run so that's what's new um and uh what's next among other things is for the endo inbox command to have a follow mode where it will um where it will uh where you can leave it running and it'll uh show all of the incoming requests um and that's that's not necessarily useful at the command line but the API underlying a followable inbox is essentially a promise for an ev an eventual async iterator for request objects that could be surfaced in a web-based user interface um, and so we can have a reactive front end that uh, essentially looks like a chat with the endo demon, uh, the endo demons administrator facet, whatever. Um, yeah, uh, and and so you would get all of the questions with reasonable inputs and be able to select a pet name, etc. Um, and that's what's working this week. That's awesome. I missed, I missed one part. How did the the, the string forty two get uh, end up as the number forty two? Um, there was a bit in there where I evaluated the number forty two as source code and assigned it the pet name forty two in a particular worker. Yeah, so to recap, the, the persistence model is that there is very similar to Git. There's a, a reference. Uh, it has references and objects, essentially, just like Git does. Um, and the objects are, uh, a, a, they, they come in two flavors. There's the content address store and also the uh, UUID keyed, um, uh, like DAG and DAG of nodes in order that are needed in order to reconstruct anything that was constructed with a pet name in the past pet names can be overwritten the underlying DAG is immutable 
um, and is garbage collectible, which is to say that if you're if as a user of the endo application, your needs evolve over time and you uninstall something or just stop using it and no longer um, carry a pet have pet name reference for it, those things can be collected, um, which which means that this system doesn't necessarily bloat indefinitely. Um, as discussed last week, one of the kinds of worker that we can eventually bootstrap on top of these ephemeral workers is a swing set worker, um, in which case, uh, in which case, uh, the transcript would be replayed for the worker next time you restart. And um, the uh, and the way that works is that the ephemeral worker would request uh, would, would a scratch space for its transcripts, etc., which would be underneath the worker directory for that worker. Um, and in that scratch space, it would record the transcript and and snapshots if necessary, um, and be able to have a more persistent worker. Yeah, uh, I have a few questions. Mm -hmm. um, can you have multiple workers and name them differently? Yes. Um, can you? Could you again show the service source code just so we can see what it looks like? where you defined the function description. Because yes. when I was first looking at it, I didn't grok that some of that text was going to be used in the inbox to show the person what uh, what's being requested. Yeah, and this is a, this is definitely pr provisional. This is the simplest version of this API. It is probably not sufficient in the long term. It's likely that that text is going to need to be constructed from a more elaborate description because the user interface needs to be able to get some hints about particular interfaces um, so that you can do things like offer to filter your list of pet names to be the useful ones, um, that kind of thing. Um, also imagine that this is, this is effectively going to serve a similar role to a password manager. Um, you could, uh, that, that, that you're having pet names to powerful capabilities. The user is interacting on the on a sort of a um, either a, a, a choose a qualifying pet name sort of user interface um, instead of having to type in sturdy references essentially. <laughs> yeah. So the the two parameters here in this case, it's a description and then just the the name of the function for invoking it. No, uh, this is um, this string answer is a pet name. Oh, oh, that's what it's going to uh, reveal. Yes. As a result, this is this is uh, every worker has its own pet name namespace, which it can use to um, refer to capabilities that has been granted in a, in a previous model uh, in a previous run. Cool. And then, so then when this request is approved, then the answer is simply returned or is it calling a function? I guess it's just returning it, right? We'd already computed answer. Request is returning, yeah, the value yeah. corresponding to the um, to the reference. Cool. Um, then uh, regarding the inbox, uh, I, I noticed right now it's just numbered. What could we establish like pet names for external connections so that inbox proposals could be a, have an attribution for who's uh, making the request yeah the um my intention is for there to be the possibility of uh well there are a couple of different user interface concerns i think one is uh it is certainly possible to have multiple inboxes. In the in this first draft, I haven't done that on account of just trying to get the simplest thing to work. Um, the the requests are attributed to the originating worker. Um, in this particular case, uh, and the worker, uh, and and the and it should be revealed by the your pet name for the worker. Um, so if I go to endo, oh, okay, you can see it here. This is supposed to be um, the the number is an affordance for the CLI that it isn't uh, it isn't part of the daemon. Um, the yeah, and it's a well, no, it is part of the daemon API because you need a token um, to name the item in the inbox that you're trying to resolve. 
Right, but I think that answers it. So if you wanted uh, pet names for the source of a request, you would create a worker daemon per external agent and then pass them access to that uh, inbox. Um, yeah, or we take a shortcut somehow. Um, right. we, we either have a worker for each or we just reify inboxes as a, as, um, yeah. yeah. Well, and then, uh, my last question was, um, oh yeah. So I think that a good sequel to this demo would be perhaps like the establishing of another daemon that then connects to it over the CAFTP connection. And, you know, so, so demonstrating how this networks together. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, uh, the route to get there is to create a service, um, one of these privileged services, which is why I've started with privileged services. <laughs> we need a foundation for introducing new capabilities. And one of those capabilities will be peer to, uh, uh, various modes of establishing peer-to-peer -peer connections. Um, so a, a live P2P service is, is some, certainly imaginable. Um, and this is how we would intend to create a bridge to the Agoric chain as well, some permissioned service that has the ability to send messages to, and receive messages from the chain. Oh, and uh, just low level, uh, what transport is the CAPTP currently operating on in this demo? Agoric's CAPTP. Um, which right, is, but that's layered on top of, of uh, um, like UDP or WebSockets or... Uh, it's, 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 it, uh, it's layered on top of an arbitrary message passing transport. In this particular case, it's net string framed TCP. Well, you know, it's a Unix domain socket. Um, cool. It's a Unix domain socket that is framing messages using NetString protocol, and the messages are JSON encoded, and the JSON encoded blobs are then passed to Agoric's CAPTP marshalling layer. Cool. So if we wanted to talk to a website with this, we would just need to make another kind of relay website or server. Yeah, um, the prototype I did last year for communicating on uh, with extensions um, used. Uh, Chrome native messaging, uh, Chrome native message hosts. Chrome native messages have their own message framing protocol. It's a 32 bit unsigned integer length prefixed messages, <laughs> and, uh, which is almost identical in spirit, if not the letter of, uh, of NetString protocol. Um, so it was a relatively small amount of code necessary to um, adapt the message framing on, uh, adapt CAPTP to that message framing. Um, so yeah, it was CAPTP over a different message frame to get to all the way out to um, over the native message host. And then on top of that, you can, and on top of that, using Chrome messages um, as a message framing protocol. And then on top of that, using message ports to get you into an actual web page. Um, is a, any, any suitable message frame is, um, is suitable for our CAPTP. Um, ordered i'm pretty sure that we couldn't we would we would have to re, re, re recreate uh we would have to create recreate a sequence sequential order on top of udp if we used udp as yeah way. yeah i definitely meant tcp but i was just trying to get your head in the layer i was asking about yeah yeah um uh building on top of socket supply co it might be possible to use quick um to do because they're uh apparently Socket Supply Co. for peer-to-peer -peer connections depends on the fact that they can hole punch UDP, but they cannot as reliably hole punch TCP. Um, so one way to recover sequentiality is to run quick, which is a UDP protocol. And I use an HTTP three stream as the message channel, essentially. For the life of me, I have no idea why UDP is easier to hole punch than TCP, as given that you can reconstruct TCP on top of UDP. <laughs> More network equipment understands TCP than whatever you reconstruct on top of UDP. Yeah, so hole punch. That's what I heard. Yeah, it was, it's, and it's true. <laughs> Yeah, um, that runs out my topic, I think, unless there are further questions. Um, the uh, As I said in chat, I have potentially a lot of questions, but I don't know if it makes sense to talk about that uh, on the record. Okay. Uh, 
All right. Well, then I'm going to uh, I'll cut a recording and start a new one. Oh, thanks.